sir. So in three, two. Good afternoon. My name is Rod McMillian, and I now call to order the meeting of the Audit Committee for September 21st, 2021. The Board of Education's October 13th, 2020 resolution provided that in the event of a medical or health emergency related to COVID-19, the board chair in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent may declare that a board meeting or a board committee meeting be held remotely in its entirety without the physical presence of board members or in a hybrid manner with only some individual board members participating remotely, subject to the establishment of a mechanism that would allow each board member the opportunity to fully participate in the meeting despite not being physically present, and that would allow the public to also remotely attend those portions of the meeting that are open pursuant to the Maryland Open Meetings Act by being able to listen and or view their portions, those portions of the meeting. Accordingly, today's audit committee meeting is being held virtually. It is also being broadcast through Microsoft Teams Live. The link is provided on the board's website and board docs. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this afternoon will be done by roll call. Board members will say their names before making or seconding a motion, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Additionally, as a courtesy to the committee, I ask that you inform Ms. Jamison if you must leave the call by using the team chat feature so that a quorum can be maintained. Ms. Jamison, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. I will start with Ms. Kastuer. Present. Ms. Rowe. Here. Mr. McMillian. Here. Ms. Joes. Thank you. Ms. Jamison, please call the roll of staff members participating in today's meeting. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. I will start with Ms. Barr. Present. Ms. Stevens. Present. Ms. Mana. Present. Mr. Fletcher. Present. Mr. Strait. Here. Ms. Sample. Present. Ms. Crew. Mr. Spore. Dr. Scriven. Present. Chris. Ms. Burnop. Present. Are there any other attendees present that I did not recognize? Hearing no additional names, I turn the meeting back to you, Mr. McMillian. Thank you, Ms. Jamison. Our next item is opening remarks. I have a few brief remarks in regards to the Baltimore County Public School Efficiency Review. As chair of the audit committee, I, by myself, support Ms. Barr, Chief Auditor, and her entire staff 100%. It is my opinion that career professionals should have the opportunity to provide a rebuttal prior to the formal release of an official document. Uh, and I, the reason I, I said specifically myself, I wrote that, it's my opinion. Uh, I didn't confer with anybody in regards to that. Okay, we're gonna move to the next item. The live video footage of our last meeting represents the minutes of the meeting. The minutes stand approved as recorded. Okay, item number two. Ms. Manna, will you please provide UHY slash OLA updates? Uh, Mr. McMillian, this is Ms. Barr. I just would like to provide a brief introduction before Ms. Manna continues. As the committee will recall, last year, uh, staff was dealing with the um, cyber attack issue, so we had agreed to postpone this agenda topic and I had committed to be to put it back on the September agenda and staff has um, been able to make some progress as well as our office. So I just wanted to give that brief introduction before Ms. Mana provided her report. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Ms. Barr. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'll start with the UHY follow up monitoring and give a little bit of a summary background first. There was one finding and 12 observations in the UHY report that was dated April 9th, 2019. Internal audit has completed and already reported on observations numbers 8 through 12, which were all related to the P card purchases. 
They were presented at the October 6, 2020 Auto Committee meeting. In summary, one of the observation recommend recommendations was determined to be in process, and the other four observation recommendations were determined to be implemented. For finding number one, which was related to financial disclosure statements, this was presented at the March 16, 2021 Audit Committee, and this recommendation was determined to be in process. We are near completion of the follow-up activity and monitoring for observations one through seven, and we're working with management to establish new target deadlines for completion of the observations that are determined to be in process. The full implementation of these op um, observations was delayed due to the cyber attack ramifications. Internal audit plans to communicate and present more details of observations one through seven at a future audit committee meeting. However, the final report will be presented when all observations are completed and we've worked with management to review the details of our report. And this report will present the follow up status and monitoring activity for each of the observations and the finding. Any questions for UHY update? Board members, any questions for Ms. Manna? I, I, will call, I will call each member's name for this purpose. Ms. Pastor? Sure. No questions, thank you. Ms. Rowe? Yes, I would just like to know if you have any sort of a expected timetable on when you think that the implementation implementation will be complete. For our monitoring process, you mean? Um, well, if I heard correct, it sounds like you said that a full report won't be until implementation is complete. And I just until, wondered, until we're complete, we'll we'll um, issue the report once we're done our follow up status and monitoring. However, there will be some items in there that are in process and the uh, BCPS's implementation on some of them are are going to go beyond that report. OK, do you know when or is that undetermined? Um, I'd have to look back on some of the modified uh, timeline because some of the items had to be pushed back due to the uh, cyber attack. So I'd have to go back and look and see where some of those timelines are and we will be following up on open items. OK, thank you. Uh, Ms. Jones, are you present? Yes, I just joined in, Mr. McMillian. Outstanding. Any questions? Thank you. No, thanks. Okay. We're going to move to item number three, new business. Uh, let me see. Ms. Barr, Ms. Manna, Ms. Stevens, and Mr. Fletcher will provide information on the risk assessment, comma, change in principal reviews, comma, training, and investigations. Before we move on to that, I do have a quick OLA update as well. OK, great, great. I'm sorry. That's OK. They were two separate projects. So the OLA um, follow, follow up and monitoring, a summary where we are with with this project is there's there were 11 findings in the OLA report, which was dated November 19th, 2020. We've recently completed the follow up and monitoring activity for one of the 11 findings. This is for number three, the um, intergovernmental cooperative purchasing agreement pricing for purchasing school buses. The work has been done for this finding and it's currently being reviewed. However, the recommendations for this finding is determined to be implemented. We'll present more details of the corrective actions and the implementation of these recommendations related to this finding at a future audit committee meeting. Additionally, we receive responses for the four IT related findings. These responses indicate that the IT findings have either been implemented or no longer applicable now that the reference systems are cloud based. We are in the process of validating these responses and then the for the remaining six findings we're going to begin follow up and monitoring for those and we plan to provide and focus more on this project once the UHY follow, follow up monitoring is complete. And again here we plan to communicate and present the status of all 11 findings at future audit committee meetings as they're completed. However, the, the final report will be presented when all findings are completed. And this report will present the follow up status and the monitoring activity for all 11 findings. Any questions there for the OLA update? Thank you, Ms. Manna. I will call each member's name for the purpose 
for the purpose of asking questions. Ms. Pastor, any questions? No questions, thank you. Ms. Rowe, any questions? No questions, thank you. Ms. Joes, any questions? No question, Mr. McMillian, thank you. You're welcome. Now I'm ready to move on to new business number three that I've mentioned before. Ms. Barr, Ms. Manna, Ms. Stevens, and Mr. Fletcher will provide information on the risk assessment, change in principal reviews, training, and investigation. Ms. Barr. Yes, sir. Thank you. Just a, a quick overview of each of those topics. So this is the first year that we've done a multi-year work plan, and um, our goal is to provide the committee continual work plan updates, whether we've completed the project or not at each of our committee meetings. So with respect to risk assessment, that's going to be the largest project that we're completing this year. I've identified and appointed um, a core risk assessment team that is headed up by Ms. Manna and Mr. Fletcher is a co-chair and um, Ms. Sample and Mr. Edwards are also on that core team. If you'll recall at our last meeting in June, we had some pretty robust conversation with respect to doing something at the schools related to um, a change in principle, although risk assessment didn't necessarily indicate that that would be a high priority, but we did do something and that is included in our work plan as a special request for unplanned project. There was also uh, a lot of conversation at our last meeting with respect to the types of trainings that are available to principals and bookkeepers and um, Ms. Stevens will provide an update on that. And then Mr. Fletcher is going to provide information about investigations and explain how we're going to present uh, information a little bit differently this year. And it'll be actually more information provided um, to the committee and to the board. So uh, at this point, I'll turn it over to Ms. Manna, who will provide an update with respect to risk assessment and the change in principle. And then after that, it'll be Ms. Stevens and then Mr. Fletcher. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Am I able to share a screen of uh, a PowerPoint slide that was presented at a previous audit committee meeting? Let me see if this. Okay. Hopefully the, the slide is presenting. It's a risk assessment project timeline. It's it's there. I see it. Okay, good. OK, so this slide was presented at a, a prior meeting, and this kind of just gives an overview of this project and where we are. And this is the second one, the orange area where it's talking about communicating with management. We are on target with our plan timeline um, as as it is on this slide. The core team, like Ms. Barr explained, is um, we meet every other week to discuss our progress, determine and plan for our next steps and to assign various tasks to the team. We've completed our initial interviews with four of the seven chiefs and the other three are scheduled for this week and next week. Um, and then Mr. Fletcher can join us to talk about the next steps that we'll be working on. Sure, sure. And, and as Ms. Mana said, uh, we are in the process of interviewing uh, the various chiefs. Uh, so our next step is gonna be to, to move through and actually talk to the executive directors uh, and other levels of management below them that, that they've identified with us, uh, including, including community superintendents, um, uh, directors, uh, managers, things like that. Um, so as we go through and we're completing our interviews, uh, we are completing a risk scoring matrix uh, based on the identified risks of the factors that, that we discuss uh, in the interviews. And this will help us determine how to prioritize not only our next uh, interviews, but also our areas of focus. And um, as we continue to move throughout this, this project, uh, certainly plan to keep updating the progress uh, at future audit committee meetings and, and continue along uh, on this timeline. And Ms. Matt, I, I turn it back over to you and, and see if we have any questions. Okay, I'm assuming that it's my turn. Are there any questions for the internal audit staff? I will call each cast, each member's name for this purpose, Ms. Pastor. Uh, no, no questions right now. Thank you. You're welcome. Ms. Rowe? No, I have no questions. Thank you. 
Ms. Joes? No questions, thank you. Okay. Now, as far as announcements, uh, the next audit committee meeting is Tuesday. Uh, excuse, excuse me. me. Excuse me, Mr. McNeely. We have to do the change in principle reviews, the okay. training, and the investigations. <laughs> I'm sorry, Ms. Barr. I'm ahead of myself again. Thank you. Okay, I will do an update on the change in principle reviews. Um, to date, there's been 31 schools with a change in principle this fiscal year. And this year, instead of an audit, we adjusted the scope of this project to complete a ch um, change in principle financial review. With this review, we verified that the responsibility for the school finances were transferred to the newly assigned principal, and we have provided specific assistance as needed as well. An email was sent to all the principals to provide them with information and to request documents from them. Our review objectives provided the new principal with an informational principal's checklist type of document of financial reminders. And then we also provided the prin new principal with the school's prior audits um, financial audits, reviews, and or follow-ups. We also reviewed financial documents for the schools. The first one was the change in, or I'm sorry, the transfer of financial responsibility form, which is a checklist that indicates that the outgoing principal has made available all school-related financial documents and has adhered to board policies related to school finances and has taken the necessary steps to transition the school's fiscal responsibilities to the incoming principal. Another document we reviewed was the updated authorized check signers from the school's bank. We ensure that the prior principal is removed and the new principal is added to the school activity fund bank account. Another document we, re we review is the Maryland Comptroller memo for sales and use tax. This is a memo that's sent to the Comptroller of Maryland to notify them that there is a change in of the in-charge person for the tax account in the school's name. We also send the new principal a listing of the current procurement card holders at the school. The incoming principal reviews and signs this listing to indicate that they agree with the individuals who have a P card at the school and they review the purchase limits as well. And the last document we request from the school is their specific money handling procedures. And we verify that it contains all of the required elements based on the offered Schoology course and that they were presented to the school staff at the beginning of the school year. At the end of our review for each of the schools, we issue a review report to the new principal. Also copied on the report is their community superintendent, their executive director, the school administrative secretary or fiscal assistant, the superintendent, the chief academic officer, the chief auditor, the senior executive director of administrative services and the executive director of fiscal services. If the outgoing principal is still in BCPS, they also get a copy of it as well. At this time, for the status of the project for the 31 schools, 18 of them are complete, two are in a review phase, and 11 are still in process. We plan to present a summary of all of these CHIP reviews at a future audit committee meeting once all 31 of the schools are completed. Any questions there? Committee members, any questions about the change in principal reviews? Ms. Pastor? No questions, thank you. Ms. Rowe? Yes, I just have one question. So in your reviews, do you review um, if the new principal thinks that there's some discrepancy in the funds, do you review the actual accounts in the actual finances? or because it sounds like you're asking for documentation to show that there's been training, but does the new principal have the opportunity to look at everything and then say, wait, I think there's a problem here and document that they inherited that problem? We do offer them to let us know if there's any concerns, including with the school activity fund accounts. If they have any concerns with any activity or balances, they can reach out to us and we will help them as as the requests come in. Also, I know accounting is doing some um, additional training and helping the new principals with with that being part of their objective. OK, thank you. Ms. Joes, any questions? No questions. OK, now we're on to training. 
Hi, I'll take that one. This is Debbie Stevens. Um, so at our last meeting, uh, we had an inquiry as to how our school ba based staff are trained regarding fiscal matters. Um, so we've put pulled together some information. We spoke with various offices um, to try to help uh, the committee members understand the types of trainings that are provided and who provides them. So prior to our switch to remote work back in March of 2020, many of these trainings were being held in person. However, you know, because we ended up going remote, a lot of those courses have been modified and they've now been integrated with the Schoology platform, which is in an asynchronous format. Uh, some benefits from that are that uh, staff now have greater flexibility as to when they complete the training, um, when it's convenient for them, and they don't have to leave school and travel elsewhere in the county for the training. Uh, part of the downside of that is that there's no personal connection with the trainer for questions or clarification. However, to help counteract this, um, assessments are often used to ensure that staff have completed the course and uh, understand the, the material that they've been presented. So I'm going to share a, a document now that um, kind of summarizes um, the different types of training and who or how it's being delivered. Um, so you'll see we actually have two page, almost two pages full of trainings just for school activity funds. Um, this is the one pot of money that a school principal is pretty much solely responsible for. So it's really important that uh, everyone in the school that handles money understands how to do that effectively. And, um, you know, we have a lot of people um, touching the money as it comes into the building. So we'll start with our bookkeepers. Um, they recently had uh, money handling training. So we did have a separate training training for elementary, middle and high school bookkeepers. This was um, run through um, the SAF accountants. And uh, the training um, included copies of any necessary forms they needed, a sample money handling procedures. And then they also uh, gave out a sample quiz that can be used um, when the bookkeeper does her presentation to her staff. So that is also a requirement once a year that all staff that handle money um, are trained by their principal and their bookkeeper. Um, and then so some of this information is what is used to uh, assist them with that presentation. So that was held um, July and September, July through September, excuse me. Um, so and then anytime a new bookkeeper comes in um, once a month, um, they hold a training for any new bookkeepers as well as um, new bookkeepers are heavily supported um, in person with the um, by the SAF accountants. Um, so we also need to have some staff in the schools that are considered backup bookkeepers. Um, that would be someone that could write receipts or make deposits if the um, regular bookkeeper is not available to do so. So that is um, one of the uh, trainings that is currently in process being put into Schoology. So that should be up and available uh, fairly soon. Um, we also have a standard, and when I say we, I mean DCPS, not internal audit, <laughs> uh, SAF money handling training. Um, this is also used as a supplement for the sponsors and the teachers um, to provide them with information as to the proper way to handle any money that they get. Um, coming into the school. Now that one is actually done through safe schools, but it is also asynchronous. Um, another group of um, employees that handle money in schools, um, high schools, are the athletic directors, and um, they have a specific training that um, they can do asynchronous on Schoology. And then in addition to that, um, the fiscal services supervisor does an in-person training. She did that this year on August 9th. So that gives the um, athletic directors the opportunity to seek clarification, ask questions, and then it also gives uh, Gail the opportunity to you know, review the procedures and, and highlight the, uh, the most important things. Another um, training that is still in progress is for uh, class account sponsors. That would be in the high schools. So there's a, a lot of um, activity involved being with being a, a high school class sponsor. And so that will include procedures for um, planning class activities and the management of those class funds. 
Again, that will be in, in Schoology as asynchronous. Uh, at the end of the year, our bookkeepers have to close their books. Um, there is a specific training for that as well, and that is that was done this past May um, in Schoology as well. Can't forget their principles. So as uh, Andrea Mana just um, mentioned, um, we they do have uh, financial orientation that is done in person by our fiscal services supervisor, and um, it's not required. Um, it is offered this year. 10 of the 21 new principals um, have e either been trained or are scheduled for training. Um, it was also offered to any of the newly transferred principals, but none of those have opted in for the training. So, and that is either done um, on site or I believe she was holding some, uh, some of the sessions at uh, Greenwood. So in addition to school activity fund training, we have procurement card training. So this is actually um, the only training that is mandatory. So once an employee is approved for a procurement card, uh, and that could be an assistant principal, bookkeeper, teacher, occasionally in a principal, um, but once they're approved, that card holder and whoever is their approving official um, must uh, attend this training through Schoology um, prior to them actually receiving their card. So, so they in this training, they get information about their rules and responsibilities and also how to use the payment net system to reconcile their purchases um, in JP Morgan Chase. So, uh, we also, our, our budget office provides training for our bookkeepers. Um, additionally, principals you know, may sit in on this as well. Um, they go out, they explain various types of funding, ac how to access reports. Um, they're provided with budget tracking spreadsheets, how to do the reconciliations. Um, in addition, he also covers um, some of the procedures and other financial areas that are related to the operating budget, such as payroll, accounts payable, and procurement cards. Um, and for the new bookkeepers, they receive ongoing visits until um, they're fully trained. So. Uh, so in addition to fiscal services, um, there's also a school-based administrative induction program. So this is um, a program that's specifically for new administrators, principals and assistant principals, to support them um, as they come into their new roles. So this is done, it's done monthly and it includes many topics, including fiscal services. So fiscal services is invited annually to present um, information related to SAF procurement, budget and other financial aspects of school administration. Um, it's done virtually um, with resource information is also provided um, in Schoology for that. So um, that did start in July this year and that uh, continued in August and I believe it will be continuing in September. So. That's another uh, area that principals or new administrators are trained in. So um, this there may be additional. This is not an all inclusive list. Um, there may be some other things that, that we have not been um, made aware of yet. But and again, things are also um, being added as as needed. Um, I know for a fact staff from fiscal services also routinely works with school personnel. Um, if anything specific comes up or if they need one on one training, that sort of thing. So. So if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to. Uh, field those committee members, any questions? Uh, Ms. Pastor. Uh, no questions, but I just want to say thank you for that very thorough presentation. Um, that was one near and dear to my heart. Thank you. Absolutely. Ms. Rowe. Um, I may email questions later. This is a very thorough report um, and there may be things to think about. I think the only real question I have right now is once we've trained staff, um, what happens should the need arise for retraining? Is that reviewed if the if the staff are actually performing their duties according to the training? How how does how does the school system determine that? 
So um, we we have made training recommendations um, as a result of audits that we have done at schools. Um, you know, again, when we go out and we talk to a new principal, if they have concerns, we may um, offer, you know, offer that that these employees be retrained as well. You know, I know Gail Peterson, who is the um, uh, fiscal services supervisor, she they are in constant contact with the school bookkeepers. Um, so they're they're always kind of in training mode. They're always answering questions and helping them out. So. Um, but it's I think that, you know, especially now with so much being in Schoology, I, I think it'll be very easy to uh, to retrain someone pretty, pretty much instantaneously um, if needed. So thank you. Miss Joe's any questions? No, thanks. I just like to state that as an athletic director, I went through the money training. Uh, the in person piece by Gail Peterson, I'd probably 10 or 12 times. And each time I found it informative and it just kind of sort of kept you on your toes. And uh, and then I even attended it once as it was presented to our faculty in the entirety. So thank you very much for that. Uh, mm -hmm. We now move on to investigations. Thank you, Mr. Millian. And I'm actually going to share my screen quickly as well. And so as Ms. Barr had mentioned earlier, um, certainly looking at, at um, different ways to present more information um, to the uh, audit committee. And so wanted to start first with something I'm, I'm sure everyone is familiar with now at this point. Uh, when we talk about investigations, um, we, we typically present this, um, uh, this report in this format. Um, and to kind of walk through, because it's been a, a few months since we've met, um, just kind of briefly walk through where we are with the investigations that so far this fiscal year. Um, two months into the year, uh, we have received 15 uh, cases total, as you can see here on the second chart. Um, in, again, the breakdown of, of the types of cases that have come through uh, are there on the first two. And then the year-over-year -year layout. Uh, over the last three fiscal years, that bottom chart. And you can see we are on par uh, with where we have been over the over the previous two fiscal years. Um, I think where we really declined last fiscal year um, was over the next couple months. We, we just kind of stayed at a much lower level, as you can see on that purple line. And, and so we're, we're kind of curious to see how um, the rest of September and October are going to be to see whether or not we we continue back up to, to normal levels or if we we stay uh, at, at the current or, or where we have been previously. Uh, and actually uh, what I'll do is I'll just roll right through uh, and talk about this report in its entirety and then talk about where we want to go with this type of information next. Uh, and so typically what we would do is, is next we would then discuss for those uh, 15 cases that have been received so far this fiscal year. Uh, how are they categorized in terms of fraud, waste, or abuse? You can see that there uh, in the top two charts on, on the second page. The, the, the top chart being just the month of August, nine cases that came in during the month of August. That second chart being the entire 15. Um, and so you can see the breakdowns there. And then again, that third chart, the bottom chart, the, the year over year breakdown. So it really talks about the composition of what type of allegations are coming in through our hotline in terms of um, or uh, types of, of allegations coming in in terms of fraud, waste, or abuse. And then we always finish up the last chart being the, the cases that we have closed. Um, and again, closed in the month of August is, is the first part. Closed for the entire fiscal year um, is, is the second chart. And so we have closed 21 cases so far um, this fiscal year. Uh, again, you can see the breakdown in terms of the, the substantiation levels. Uh, whether something was substantiated, unsubstantiated, and conclusive, uh, or if it was uh, truly a management issue and, and something that we did not investigate. Uh, and again, again, at the bottom, uh, the third chart, that's our year-over-year -year analysis uh, for the, the previous uh, fiscal years. Um, the, the one thing, and, and having gone through this, this process several times, first two months, first three, four months usually of, of data, uh, everything's kind of... Um, uh, out of whack, uh, so to speak, in terms of when you look at year over year. 
uh, especially for the case substantiation and the uh, fraud, waste, and abuse, just because th there's not enough data um, to, to really balance things out. Once we're a, a quarter or so into the year, we, we've kind of uh, balanced back out. So it's, uh, although, although we do look at those comparisons, we, we certainly are cognizant of that uh, to know that really one or two cases could cause uh, percentages to to spike, so to speak, more so than that we would normally have to worry about. So this is where, where we have been. This is what we have been presenting uh, to the audit committee uh, monthly to really discuss and, and provide an update as to where we are in terms of uh, our investigations. Um, and so where we want to go, I uh, still want to continue to do this, but now I want to, to also provide a, a quarterly report um, that will be a little bit more encompassing. Still talking about the same numbers, uh, but instead we're giving a little bit more detail as to what some of those cases are. And I can walk you through the, the format so far. And again, this is just a draft. Uh, I, I know that we're certainly going to make some changes to this in terms of the, um, not so much the content, but, but perhaps the structure or the order of it. Uh, but again, with the same goal of we're going to give you Going back to, to this graphical analysis, we're going to give you more information on these 21 cases that, that have been closed and substantiated. Not necessarily case level detail, but at a much higher level. Uh, so you may know where, you may know what the allegation was, uh, you, you may know what the substantiation was for that specific case. And so what that's going to look like is something like, something like this here. So we'll start again um, with cases that we've received. Uh, we'll go through, it'll be a small narrative. We'll have a table uh, to discuss numbers of, of what's come in and how they're categorized. Uh, again, very similar, just not in a, a chart format similar to, to what we have been presenting. And then we'll have a, a secondary table we'll talk about status of all cases that have come in for the fiscal year. So whether they've been, or I'm sorry, whether they're open, closed, uh, referred out to management, we're waiting responses back. Wh wherever they may be in the investigatory process, we'll be able to, to document that here. Uh, and then our third chart is, is kind of where we get into some of the detail level that I was just speaking to. And so here we would talk about closed cases. And, and again, we're talking about uh, if, if we leave this level of detail, you would know a, a location, um, what the actual issue was. So was it theft? Was it a misuse of resources? Um, when we talk about the alleged details, it'd be at a very high level. Um, you know, it, an employee did this. It wouldn't have names or anything like that. Um, report status. At this point, we're talking about closed reports, so we may not even include that include this field. But it's it's you know we're we're talking about closed reports, and then we would talk about the the actual result, uh, whether we were able to substantiate that or unsubstantiate it, or if it was um, inconclusive. So we will put something like this in as well. And then uh, the next table talking about these would be the reports that the allegations that came in uh, that we referred to management. Uh, and again, same type of level of detail. And then these are, when I say referred to management, these are things that we've referred to management for them to review and then provide a response back to us. Okay, I know sometimes we confuse referred to management as, um, uh, as something that's coming through the hotline that we're going to give to uh, an executive director or a chief and not expect any response back from. That's not this. This is something that we're we're saying, hey, I need your feed. I need your response back on this. So I'm going to I'm going to give you the case details. Please take a look at it and, and uh, provide your insight. So that would go here and then. Uh, this would be our memos, the file, and those are the cases where uh, going back to what I was just referring to something comes in through our hotline and we're going to give it to management, but it's not something we're going to investigate and, and we don't want a response back from management, but we really need to make sure that they're aware that that information came through our hotline. Um, so uh, items like that, uh, items that come through our hotline that are really, uh, there's no allegation, but it's more information, they're, they're requesting information from us. Um, that Those types of things would, would fall into this uh, final table here. Uh, and then we would just have a conclusion to kind of wrap up where we are as of uh, that quarter. And so if we we provide that level of information, uh, again, this would be quarterly. Um, and what we would do uh, is so obviously 
end of end of the quarter. We would pre present this next month. Um, um, I believe our, our meeting is October 19th. So on October 19th, uh, we would have this the same discussion, but instead of presenting the the initial uh, charts that we initially showed, we would present something more similar to this report here, uh, and then we could walk through and discuss those. Uh, and then again, three months later, after the after uh, the next quarter ended, we would do the same. And so, Mr. McMillian, I turn it back over to you for any questions. Thank you, uh, committee members. Any questions, Ms. Pastor? No, thank you. Ms. Rowe? Yes, I have one question. Um, it was my understanding, and we did get an email from Mr. Kuhn about this, that at some point the investigation reports are released to the board and closed documents after there's any potential appeals exhausted. When will that be happening? I'll, I'll take that question. This is Ms. Barr. Ms. Rowe, we're trying to figure out the best way to get the information to the board members um, to make sure that the information remains confidential. In the past, we had an easy way to do it. Uh, now we don't have quite an easy way, and I have over 400 reports um, sitting here trying to figure out the best way to communicate and send it to the board members while again maintaining confidentiality. So I do realize that we are behind in submitting um, Q2 and 3 reports from last year to the board, as well as um, we're waiting uh, for feedback back from the law office for uh, Q4 reports from last year. So as soon as we get that straightened out and figured out um, through an IT process, we'll get those out immediately. But I might have to go report by report for each individual uh, board member, and that that's what we're trying to avoid. So I do apologize for the delay in, in getting that communication out to the board members, but we are working on that to try to get that done as expeditiously as possible. And again, maintaining confidentiality. So is this still a result of the ransomware attack? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? I didn't hear that. Is this um, difficulty a result of the ransomware attack? Well, I guess indirectly it is because we've had to change our process and the type of software that we use and the information um, and how we have to protect the document has changed. So that did all occur because of the, the cyber attack. Okay, all right. I would appreciate um, if you would give us some idea when we'll get those reports as you acquire that information. Yes, I will. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Joes, any questions? Yes, Ms. Barr, when you said you would have to go report by report, how much time would that entail? And when you said that you would need to, um, for confidentiality, go through for each board member, is that to digitally trace it in case it gets forwarded or leaked? Um, how much time would that mean for your staff and you to get that ready for us? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, so um, yes, the reason that we have to do it this way is because um, the board um, decided not to sign the non-disclosure agreements. So what we do is, and Keith would have to speak to how much time it takes to put all the watermarks on for each individual board member, for each individual report, and each report has, uh, you know, d different number of pages, different number of exhibits. So that takes a lot of time. And then um, just tracking that, okay, uh, Miss Joes, I have to send you 50 reports. So, and if I have to go line by line and, and click on the arrow and make sure that I click, you know, do not, cannot forward, cannot, you know, um, print. And then it, it's just very, very time consuming. It's going to take days to do that. I'm trying to, I, did attend a, a, a training last week, and I think that I might be able to figure something out um, that would allow us to do it, to get the information to the board members quickly um, and not be as time consuming. I'm hoping that that's good, going to work. If not, I'm going to uh, consult uh, one more time with Mr. Corns and, and his staff 
to see if there's a better way to, to handle this. And um, and we are working with uh, Mr. Korn's staff to get um, our other audit reports posted to the BCPS website. So that's just a little uh, aside with respect to the other reports. So it is a very time consuming process because we have um, 12 members of the board that need to receive multiple reports. And um, Mr. McMillian, if I could have a follow up question, please. Yes, please go ahead, Ms. Jones. What was that? Yes, Ms. Barr, this again arises from the board's um, reluctance to sign a non disclosure to receiving these, these reports. And remind me, just refresh my memory, the previous board did they receive these reports in bulk like we are? If you could refresh my memory, please. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, you faded out. Uh, what did you say about the previous board? Uh, hang on. So can you remind me how this was dispensed out for the previous board and the time consumption comes because you have to digitally encrypt, encrypt this report because the board is refusing to sign a non-disclosure. So if you could just refresh my memory in the, on, on those things. Thank you. So previously the um, reports were distributed only to the audit committee chair at the direction of the former board chair. So it, they were only going to one individual member of the audit committee, but then um, this board, you know, voted to um, extend the distribution of the reports to all board members. And we went through a process with the former board council um, who had suggested the um, non-disclosure agreement. I believe he had drafted a non-disclosure agreement. I was not privy to the conversations as to, to why um, board members declined to do that. But so we had to, to you know, figure out alternatives. And I think because of the um, cyber attack and, you know, having to restore documents, recover documents, things of that nature, we have more reports available to send than normal. And that's why I say we have about 400 reports to send out, whereas if we would have been able to do this on a quarterly basis, it would have been more manageable. I think the first quarter, it took me almost two days to do, to send the reports out. And I, and that does not include the time that Mr. Fletcher has to do to um, affix the watermarks to all the individual pages on all the reports. I don't know how much time that takes him to do. I would assume that's a lot of time man hours going in. <clears throat> so my uh, concern here is, again, from board efficiency, how much time that's taking away from you guys doing your work because of the board asking these reports. And, and that's a lot of reports, and I'm going to be honest, I don't have time to read through 200 pages of reports. Um, so, you know, at what cost fiscally and Labor-wise, if it's, if it's being provided, so when you guys do go forward with it, you could keep a track of that for the record of how much time-wise it costs uh, to produce this. That would be appreciated. Thank you. Yes, we can do that. And Ms. Spar, I just want to say this. If, if you can think of any way possible that I could help you, uh, help you expedite this or, or whatever, uh, you need me to converse with anybody to any any way you think I could help you with that. Please don't hesitate to ask me. OK. OK, thank you so much. You're welcome. Now on to uh, item number four on the agenda announcements. The next meeting of the audit committee will be on Tuesday, October 19, 2021 at 430 p.m. Is there any further business committee members? Yes. Mr. McMillian. Yes, we have somebody. Somebody said something. There. I said something, but Miss Whoever chimed in can go Ms. first. Oh, um, Ms. Rowe can go first. Ms. Rowe. So, in regard to your comment about um, the Office of Internal Audit, uh, I would like to hear from Ms. Barr because they said that there was some that the central office was allowed to provide feedback. And I would like to know what involvement her office was permitted in that efficiency review. Uh, 
Uh, Mr. McMillian, would you like me to respond to that now or would would you like me to include the committee with the rebuttal? Um, adv please advise. Uh, really, whatever you're comfortable with. Uh, Ms. Rowe, Ms. Barr's constructed a rebuttal. Uh, I'm not sure she's real close to having finished that. Uh, the, her staff is reviewing it the, the last time we spoke about it. Uh, would you be comfortable if once they were finished with that, she provided the board members with the rebuttal, Ms. Rowe? Sure, I'm not looking for a point by point at this time. Basically what I wanna know is if she was given the same courtesy as the central office, because there seems to be this idea that she wasn't and I'd like to know from her. Ms. Ms. Barr, are you comfortable answering that question? Yeah, I, I was not provided that same opportunity, Ms. Rowe. Okay, so they wrote it and you didn't get to review it before it was published? That's accurate. Okay, thank you. Ms. Pastor, you had a question, please. Uh, no, I actually have a statement. It, it sort of goes full circle to the way you began the meeting, and this is just coming from me. I am a board member and a committee person, so I, it's hard to talk about any of this and say it's just about me and it's my point of view of the world because I sit on the board and we certainly know things that others don't know. So um, I just want to make it clear. Uh, I know this may be the fifth or sixth time I've said this. Let me just say um, as of yesterday, Maeve is going to have a, a meeting for boards in November probably. So you will understand Anybody want to say it with me? Um, uh, uh, the ramifications of blueprint for Maryland's future. One of the things that hit me, and I'm putting it here on the audit committee, this the our internal audit department comes under us. That's number one. All right. So anything moving and shaking must be about how the board understands where we are and where we're going. And to that end, we need right now, everybody, and I mean body like physical body, that's in that office, we need them. And we might well, as we get down the road, need even more. You need to read what the stipulations are and the law of surrounding this blueprint to understand that that which I've heard you, Ms. Rowe, um, articulate, Ms. Barr has repeatedly articulated the whole notion of projects. How we survive, how we fare in terms of a system is greatly undergirded by this department. I see understanding this blueprint well. Let me turn my camera on so you can see my hands flying. I understand very well, very well, what this plan is about. This department is going to undergird everything that is going to happen. They have the potential, and I'm saying this now because for all the other things that have been passed and on whatever level um, that we're asking the audit department to do, understand that they have a mammoth job ahead of them because they are the ones who can see how things are flowing in the right direction and how things are flowing upstream when they should be going down. They are going to, this that they are doing, I just lost the word, what is it, Ms. Barr? The, um, mm, 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 begins with the R. Woo Risk assessment. Thank Risk you, assessment. Woo thank you, big word, one syllable. Risk assessment. They are, while they are looking at that, they get the bird's eye view of what we're gonna have to tighten up understand that the board along with the system as a whole we have a we have a plan to turn in i think it's like june 15th of 2022 that's around the corner so while we are processing a myriad of things that you want to see and 
think ought to be happening. All of that is true, but understand that they have a bunch of new things that are being plopped on their plates that are, are the things that are gonna be necessary for saving, for growing this system. So all of us before our next audit meeting and our next board meeting and our next every other meeting, please delve into that blueprint. It is not an easy piece. It's not bullets. It's not, it, it's not Saturday evening reading before you go to sleep. This is serious. It is the law. This department and those of us that are on this committee have a heady and heavy task in front. We need to give this department all of the support we possibly can. Remember, they are connected to us as the board. And, and I, I, I know I sound like I'm preaching because I am, because this is how I talk about Blueprint even when I sit at the MAID meetings and Blueprint meetings, because this is not a joke. So whatever we thought was important before, everybody better click their heels, push back the curtain and come out of Oz. This is serious, it's the law. Ms. Pastor, thank you very much. And it looks like you have your cat on my lap, or wait a minute, my cat on your lap. That's I know, my... he has no respect. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, uh, may I have a, any other comments? Committee members? Okay, may I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. May I have a second? Second row. Ms. Jamison, please have a roll call vote. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Joes? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Mr. McMillian? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Since there's no further business, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much for putting up with me, and I hope everybody has a great evening. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Bye. you. Good night.